then I, I get called, I got to go to Afghanistan. So I, I sort of forgot about it. I get back a year later. Well, I, hold on. You were called up as an active duty soldier? Uh, I'm reserved. So I was on active at the time, yeah. All right. So you're called overseas to serve your country. What happens in your absence? <laughs> you go back to the court. And uh, I, obviously I couldn't be there, and it was unbeknownst to me. I find out from my collector, so I touch base with him when I get back. And I said, hey, you know, what's what's going on with the the, the deal we got? Um, so what, they overturned it while you were away in Afghanistan serving your country? Overturned, yeah. The, the, guy, the exact word said to me by the collector was, um, yeah, well, you know, New York's gotten even a little bit more liberal since you've been away. Uh, the court of appeal, he took it to the court of appeals, and you know this is a pro tenant, pro deadbeat. Um, yeah, well, Mike, you know you sound like you have a good attitude towards it. You lost a small amount of money; it wasn't small at the time. It seems to me you've overcome it and risen above it. Isn't that true? Yeah, I actually did end up taking him back to the court too. All right, all right. Listen, it's enough. It's enough. You know, there's a time to fold too. It's $3,000, you can turn this into a I know people who go on and on with one case for the, for 10 years. A mold in the ceiling. They sue the tenant, they, they sue the landlord, and then, then they sue the manufacturer of the board. Then they sue God, then they sue the water company. They go on for 10 years, they think there's a rainbow with a pot of gold at the end of the lawsuit. There's nothing. You know how much money you could have made if you took your mind and put it on earning money? You could have developed a mop, for God's sake. Back in a minute. I don't know where the hour went. We have a minute left in the hour. I told you there's a secret about radio. When a show is flying along, it means people love it. When you are doing a show where you can't believe you're still in break number two and you think you're going to have a heart attack, it means you're, you're a bore and you, can, you should consider another profession. This is one of those great days, and I didn't think it would happen like this because, frankly, we're talking about courts, lawyers, justice, injustice. It's because of something that happened to me today. The Supreme Court ruled in my favor yesterday. And here's the irony of it. I didn't even know about it yesterday. The lawyer forgot to send it to me. I swear to God, I never got it. So 30, 40 minutes before the show, I hear, oh, did you know you won in the Supreme Court yesterday? I said, what? And you didn't send it to me? No. Great, thank you. He's only been a, a over a million dollars in five years. Why should I hear about that? It's not important to me. Then I see a story. I don't know if it's related. About a guy I knew who was arrested for giving the wife allegedly a nice little, uh, I don't know if there's any relationship, but it happened the same day. Who knows if there's a relationship? Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Everybody, get out your bell bottoms. It is Disco Tuesday on the Savage Nation. Why? Because I want it to be. That's all. You think I care about Obama's speech later? Are you kidding me? I'd rather go to a cancer ward than listen to him. The stupid applause. I'm embarrassed to be an American when I watch the State of the Union address. And that goes for both sides. They march, the de aisle, the touching, the glad handing. Every minute he utters it, uh, and I want to say, uh, and 15 minutes, they clap like dunces, in in the chair, up in the chair, and down in the chair. What a country. I wish this country would grow up already. We're not living in the 18th century with the State of the Union address. He's got the Internet. He's got a radio. He's got a TV outlet. What's with the State of the Union? So the buggy whip. He gave a speech. They ran home to the newspaper. and They gave a, oh, look what the president just said. Here's the State of the Union. Like, we don't know what it is. We don't know what a wreckage there is out there. We don't know what he's done to undermine everything from the military to the, to the Federal Reserve. I got to listen to this double-talking, community-organizing, anti-American. No, see, I don't want to get started on that. 
We're talking instead about injustice, justice, court horror stories. And I will get back to them. If you're on the line, please stay on the line. But I want to go to my good friend, haven't seen him in years, to talk about, well, you'll hear what. Mike Levine, welcome to the Savage Nation. You're on line 10. Michael, how are you? How have you been? I, I, I'm fine, Michael. I'm so happy to hear your voice again. It's been a while. Can you Can you believe that I'm still alive and kicking? No, I honestly I don't. <laughs> I'm a trial. Man, that, thanks, for, thanks for the compliment. It was it was like 20 years ago, Michael, that you came out to California. I can't believe time has gone by, and you're on the stage with me and great people. And we did the Compassionate Conservative event down in the Marin Civic Center. We had dinner down in Sausalito. And you are like my hero to this day. You are undercover. i got to remind people. Tell people the name of the books you've written, Michael. It's important that they know. Well, uh, Deep Cover, which was a New York Times bestseller, and The Big White Lie. And it, it, Deep Cover is now, you know, with this uh, uh, Sean Penn, Furor, and all of that Deep Cover, is now becoming, you know, kind of important again. Uh, it's going up on the bestsellers list, if you can believe it. It, uh, it, because it's all about undercover inside the Mexican government and drugs. And uh, it, it, to me, it's Michael, just, I, I want I want people to learn a little bit about you. You grew up in in the Bronx, did you? I did. I grew up in the South Bronx in a neighborhood that started out as the Italian, Jewish, Irish. And by the time I was 13, it was mostly Puerto Rican and black. And uh, I was among the, you know, the, the poor, poor Jews, uh, poor, you know, the, the poor white folks who stayed uh, in the neighborhood, couldn't move. And uh, to me, it was a great benefit. I loved it. I loved going but you up. But you learned Spanish. And you know the di some of the dialects which you used as an undercover, if I remember... You did deep undercover in Bolivia and pose as an Italian. Did you pose as an Italian gangster? Oh, hey, I, my 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 role, uh, the role that I used in Deep Cover and The Big White Lie was Miguel Luis Garcia, and I passed as a half Sicilian, half Puerto Rican American mafia don. So that explained why I could speak, uh, you know, fluent Spanish with a Puerto Rican. Uh, accent, and I spoke a lot of Italian, enough to get over. I, I, I'm, I'm not really bilingual with Italian, but, uh, you know, for, the, for those Italian listeners, me arrangio, me arrangio in Italiano. I speak enough <laughs> to get over. And uh, so that was my, that was actually my pose for many, many, many years, and I, I worked deep cover cases from Bangkok to Buenos Aires to Bogota, and it was a hell of a life. I was, you know, I'm privileged. I wake up in the morning, I reach over and touch my wife just about every day and and realize what a miracle it is. And you too, Michael. A miracle that you know, people like you and me just survived this whole thing. Are you kidding me? I wake up, I, you know, it's funny you're talking about that because survival itself is a victory in this day and age, especially in an age of lies and deceit, just to get up every morning and have two legs and two arms and a and a brain is a, is a miracle, Michael. But let's move on to the Sean Penn situation. Is is a guy crazy or what? Did he do this for 15 minutes of fame? He he needed another high. The, we know that the guy needs a constant high of one kind or another. That's a given. So what he did this for another high to be relevant without thinking about the consequences? He he. I don't think he understood. He was listening to lawyers who were telling him, "Ah, oh, you're legally okay, you know, but they're the ones he's going to hire and pay about two or three million to defend him when the government comes down on him. But that's neither here nor there. What he does not realize is that he stuck his head into a viper's nest. What, these are kill-crazy people. They were ISIS before ISIS existed. You, don't forget these Mexican cartels were putting uh, severing heads and putting them on top of school posts long before ISIS even existed. So that's the mentality he's dealing with. What he did, what he did by aligning himself with Chapo, Chapo Guzman uh, was dangerous on several fields. Number one, Chapo Guzman has as many enemies uh, as Bin Laden did. And he, he now is aligned. And the woman, De Castillo, they're both considered uh, targets, just targets even for the hell of it, because the great no notoriety that these kill, kill crazy people would get just from killing Sean Penn, especially Kate de Castillo, because she, she's back and forth in Mexico, they have no idea of the kind of people 
who would just kill them for the hell of it. They wouldn't even ha have to get paid. But, Michael, you know these people. You worked, you know, as undercover in the DEA. Let's talk about reality. You're not, not just a caller to a radio show. You know this. Are you telling me that this movie star is so detached from reality that he actually thinks he's in a movie and he can get away with it because he's Sean Penn? kind of amazing to me i mean back in the days when i did this and i lived that role uh i look back and i realize i was kind of crazy I, you know this i survived it but what i learned is the lens through which i'm talking about sean penn right now i know these people i live with them uh you know in deep cover we uh, i capture one scene where i'm with Mexi two mexican hitmen in a room in panama for about 12 hours, waiting to hear basically my fate, whether or not the Mexicans were going to go through with a 15-ton cocaine deal. And uh, at that point, I'm dealing with uh, the Mexican government. Well, the, one of the hitmen, a guy by the name of Chuy, he had been shot six times by the uh, Mexican federales in a shootout, and he's took his shirt off, and there, there are the holes, 45 caliber holes all through his back and butt. And... What I learned from talking to people, him and people like it, is, look, Mike, if you go swimming with white sharks, what are they going to do? They'll kill you, because that's what they do. Guys like Chewy, that's what they do. They kill you. That's, that's all he does. He doesn't care about anything else. He's given a, an assignment, and he kills. There's no going back. Once they hold so in, Mike, Michael, wait, wait, Mike, wait. Let's back up a minute. Sean Penn, as we know, is a self-aggrandizing, narcissistic movie star. He goes and does this. He doesn't think this through at all. No one tells him, "Wait a minute, you're getting yourself into a situation that may wind up harming you or, God forbid, your family." No one told him that. I don't think so. I think he talked to lawyers. He was more worried about whether or not the government was going to bust him. All right, well, can the U.S. government, I know that the U.S. attorney, Preet Bahara, who's a great crime buster, is looking into charges against him. Are there any valid charges in your estimation against Sean Penn? There, there may be. I don't know all the facts. Look, I worked, I worked for an attorney, Bob Semmels, in New York. And there was an international drug case, and the next thing I know, Bob Semmels is busted right out from under me. And he's busted for conspiring to kill a, uh, a, a, a witness in, in uh, Guyana, British Guyana. And he, first he asked me to come down there with him, but I didn't go. And he, he, I don't know whether he was actually doing it or not, but what I do know, what I did find out, was that a paid informer got in and talked to him. Now, the paid informer is, was the main testimony against Bob Semmels. And he was wired, so I don't know who Sean Penn met. He might have met informants. He might there might have been informants there. They may be taped. They might have taped some of this stuff. So it depends on the details. If if uh... Michael, let's say he said that he did. He covered according to what I've read. He covered his tracks so that he couldn't be traced. He didn't intend to lead anyone to El Chop, to Chapo, Guzman. Uh, he had nothing to do with uh, this and that. Blah blah blah. But it turns out the Mexican government was following him every step of the way. They published pictures of Sean Penn. Today, getting off an airplane in a jungle airstrip. Now, where does that lead us in terms of dis deciding whether this guy is in danger or not? Well, he, he's in, uh, in danger on many, many levels. I don't know. I have no idea how this can pan out. We know when, I, when I'm retained as an expert on informants and undercover tactics in a court, I am given all the documents. I'm given what they call discovery. And then I can tell where the, the case is going to go. See, with, with Sean Penn, if they indict him, for something, you can bet that there is a line of evidence showing violations of laws in Mexico and U.S. federal law. And, the, and I've seen, I've been with the United States attorneys when they sit down and they go through these monster law books looking for crimes that were committed. And it's astonishing that you can you, in, these, in these huge law books, Title 18, Title 21, they, if they want you, they will get you. And that is no BS. And anybody, any cop, any agent who's been in the business knows that I am speaking the truth. So right now, you know, when I wrote Deep Cover, I was going to do the Phil Donahue show. I got a phone call from DEA headquarters. Somehow they knew I was in the green room. And the, the man on the, on the phone was a high-ranking guy. And he'd heard about my book. It was coming out. They had intelligence. They knew exactly where I was. And this is what he said to me. 
Right now, while I'm talking to you, Mike, there are ten lawyers going over your book looking for a place to indict you. And I said, mm. Frank, 